Good evening, brethren. Please take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 17. Turn to John chapter 17 and verse 14. John chapter 17 and verse 14. The title for the sermon tonight is Adapting to Change. Adapting to Change. And as I was thinking about what to preach on tonight, uh, I thought a lot about how uh, our, our world is changing, you know, uh, with this coronavirus, um, a lot of things have changed, you know, how we conduct church services. Thank God that churches are allowed to open up this coming Sunday here in Australia, but it's limited to, to 10 people. And, you know, we're going to have to get used to the changes that are in place at this point in time. And I realized that the topic of change, like when I, when I think about myself personally, I don't like change. You know, generally speaking, I don't like change. And generally speaking, most people do not like change. Most people like things to stay as they are, and they tend to rebel uh, with change. But the reality is, some change is outside of our control. Some change will happen, and you've got nothing, you, you can't do anything about that, brethren. And so the, the purpose for tonight's sermon is to help you as a believer, as a church member, as a child of God, to understand that the world around you will change. It has changed. Even before this coronavirus, the world around you has changed. And we need to learn how to adapt to change. Okay, We need to learn so we can continue being effective servants of God, so we can continue doing the work of God, so we can continue remaining positive-minded. And so that's the purpose for the sermon tonight please go to john 17 look at verse number 14 the bible reads i have given them thy word and the world have hated them because they are not of the world even as i am not of the world what i want you to know brethren is that you are not of this world yes you live in this world yes god wants you to serve him in this world but spiritually speaking you are not of this world you are of the kingdom of God. Let's keep going. Verse number 15. Jesus says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So when you think about this world, when you think about our governments, you think about the laws that have been passed, you think about all the changes that are against the Bible, and then you think about Jesus Christ, I mean, don't you think, I mean, those two things are so incompatible, aren't they? We think of Jesus Christ as the perfect Son of God without sin, the Word manifest in the flesh, and then we have our governing authorities that are being pulled, you know, by, you know, by strings by Satan. You know, so we have this seemingly opposite things, but we are to live for Christ, we are to serve Christ, and yet at the same time, Christ says to the Father, don't remove them from the world. Keep them there in the world. So there are two great truths to think about there. Number one, that we are to operate in this world. We are to operate with a corrupt government. We are to operate within uh, the, this world. You know, the Bible calls Satan the prince of this world. You know, Satan has a kingdom on, in this world and his, his influence definitely is in those high places of authority. You know, in, in the high places of influence, not just governments, but the places that influence the media, you know, the places that influence people. Satan has a foothold in a lot of these areas, but we are to operate within the world, but we are not of the world. We are not to be like the world. We are to be like Jesus Christ. Look at the end of verse number 15. It says, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So even though Jesus wants us to operate in the world, he wants us to be protected from evil. He doesn't want us to go down an evil path, okay, or be destroyed by evil. So there's a few things there, right? We are to operate in this world, but we are not to be of, um, of this world. We are not to be of the evil of this world. And so as I, as I mentioned, we are living in a changing world. You know, the new term that's been thrown around for the last month or so is the new normal, you know. And, and the idea there is that things aren't going to go back to the way they used to be. All the freedoms that you once held, all the rights you once had are not going to return in the same capacity post-COVID world, right? We are entering into a new normal and they're very careful with the phrases they use 
you know, what they should say, they should just be honest and say, things are going to be completely different. Things are not going to be the same. They'd rather say the new normal. In other words, they want you to think that what's coming is still normal. But brethren, it's not normal. Things are going to change. And I realize, you know, my hope is that things will go back to normal. You know, my hope is that the world will be back to the way it used to be before uh, the coronavirus, but I recognize that it's most likely not going to be the same. There's mo most likely a lot of our rights are going to be stripped away as, uh, as citizens of Australia. You know, we're going to lose a lot of the freedoms we once held, maybe so, but we are still to operate in this changing world. And so the title, once again, is ado ado Adapting to Change. We need to learn how to adapt to change. Be prepared to adapt. And like I said, no one generally likes change. People like things to remain as, as things are. They like to operate through the same things day in and day out, and they hate change. I remember when I used to work for a, quite a large company, um, there was a time where things started to change very rapidly. So much so that the employees were starting to become resistant toward the changes. And so what needed to be put in place were training sessions or consultation of helping people adapt to change. And I realize this because we, we are creatures that, we are creatures of habit. We like to, things to remain as they are. We don't like to, to change much about ourselves. And we ought to understand though, the world is constantly changing. There is a saying that says the only constant is change. And that's a statement from uh, Heraclitus. Now, I don't know, that's some philosopher before Christ, I believe. Now, that's kind of true. The only constant is change. It's kind of true. What you'll notice that in your life, you've gone through much change in your life. I mean, you're no longer a baby. You know, and the baby that changes into a toddler, and the toddler into a child, and the child into a teenager, and the teenager into an adult. And what you'll find during those stages of change, that your interests change. You know, your, your, your friends change, right? Your family may have changed. I grew up with my, my mother and father and my brother. Hey, but I don't live with them anymore. I have a new family. I have a wife. I have children, right? We are constantly changing. We need to understand this is just a reality of life, but change is not the only constant. There is something else that is very constant. If you know your Bibles, if you're a believer of the, of, of the Lord God, you know that our Lord God never changes. In Malachi 3, 6, God says, For I am the Lord, I change not. I change not, says the Lord. Hebrews 13, verse 8, speaking of Christ, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this is the beautiful thing about being a Christian is even though the world changes, even though our life changes, we can always be stable though. We can always be sound. We can always be unmovable as long as you have the God of the Bible as your God, as long as you are a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible also says in Isaiah 40 verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever, shall stand forever forever. You see, for all eternity, the Word of God will never change. What is written will stay written a hundred years from now, two thousand years from now. Hey, it's the same that things that were written two thousand years ago as well. As well. The Word of, the, of God never changes. It will stand forever. And so, this is why Jesus Christ speaks about, you know, um, about His words being the rock. And we ought to build our lives upon the rock. And the rock are his words, the Bible. Okay? And our Lord God is a rock. Our Lord God never changes. You know, that's, a, that's a great truth you know, that we can always have that stability in life. But the world changes. Okay? Circumstances change. Technologies change. All right? I mean, so many things have changed and we need to learn how to adapt to change. So this sermon tonight is not in support of a new normal. I know some people are going to hear my preaching and they're going to conclude that Pastor Kevin is in favor of the lockdowns. He's in favor of the COVID-19 app, which our Prime Minister wants 40% of Australians to download. 
you know, he'd be in favour of vaccinations or whatever. I'm not in favour or in support of these actions, but I do understand that we still have to learn how to adapt. You know, when Paul the Apostle went preaching the gospel, he says to the Jew, I became a Jew. The Apostle Paul had to learn how to adapt in how he served the Lord in different places, different places of the world, different people he was dealing with. He had to learn to adapt. He needed to learn, how can I reach these people? Hey, the, the situation over here is different than it was over there, and I need to change my approach in order for me to be effective for the Lord God. And brethren, when it comes to this new normal, we need to start thinking, how can we adapt? How can we change to make sure we can continue serving the Lord God and not fail in the great commission that God has given? So look, I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to come with this sermon tonight giving you all the answers, but I want to give you a few things for you to think upon so you can start applying it in your own personal life. And because I found myself, with all the changes, a little bit agitated. I found, I found myself sometimes lacking a bit of sleep. You know, I was very uh, uncomfortable. And then I had to just bring back to my remembrance, you know, all the things that I had done to adapt to change. And I've had to adapt to change in many, many ways in our life, okay? What this sermon is, is to help you change or adapt in a rapidly changing world, okay? And as I said, we've all experienced change. Sometimes you're the one that's brought in the change. Other times, someone else outside of your control has brought in that change and you've had no choice but to learn how to adapt to that. Okay? Now, if you can go to Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Because, you know, our, 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 our nation is changing and the world is changing, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, I... I, can, I, I understand some believers, some Christians desire to change our government. Okay? They have a desire potentially to get into politics, a, a desire to, to you know, uh, influence the way our, our government uh, has their you know, policies and, and uh, put into effect their laws. And look, there's nothing wrong with that in of itself. But I want you to understand that we will never have a perfect government. We will never have politicians that love the law of God, you know, at least on this side of, of the millennium, right? When Christ comes big, back and establishes the millennium with his government, with his own system, hey, we'll be there serving Christ. We'll be ruling and reigning with him. That's when we can expect a perfect government. But all we can hope for right now in, in, on this side is for our politicians to have some fear of God, you know, consider some of the laws of God in how they bring about, uh, you know, policies. And, uh, and as pastors and as preachers, to just preach what the Bible says and hope these words reach the ears of our politicians. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So this is before Jesus Christ ascends to heaven. He's approached by one of his disciples. You know, are you going to come? Are you going to restore the kingdom of God now? Why are they asking that question? Because Judea was under control of the, the Romans. Okay, it was, it was under the control of the, the Roman governors. And so, you know, Israel was not operating the way God had intended it to operate when he brought in the Old Covenant, right? When he had pulled the Israelites out of Egypt, gave them their own piece of land, made them a nation, made them, uh, you know, that holy nation, they were now operating outside of how God had intended it. And so they're asking Jesus, is it time now? Is it time now for us to have that perfect government? Are you going to usher in the kingdom to Israel now? Notice Jesus, you know, how much did Jesus care about reforming the government. How much did Jesus care at this point in time anyway? Look at verse number seven. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father have put in his own power, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. 
So look, Jesus Christ basically ignores the question. He says, you know, this guy comes, is it now, Lord? Is it time for us to reform the government now? To bring the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus says, look, don't worry about it. If that's the Father's business, you know, he, he knows the time. And Jesus Christ, of course, speaking about his millennial reign. He says, but something else is more important, and that's the need to make sure that we preach the gospel. That throughout the entire world, the gospel message will go out throughout, you know, from your local neighborhood all the way to the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus Christ had serving God as his priority, not reforming the government. Okay, that's important for you to understand because this may feel like there's a contradiction here, you know, in the Bible. Because when we read the Old Testament, don't we see time and time again where God raises judges, where God raises prophets to preach against, you know, a corrupt leader in authority or to, you know, a judge where they would uh, win back you know, to, uh, uh, deliver their people out of the hands of some conquering, you know, outside conquering nation? You know, do we not see time and time again where God raises a prophet and he's preaching against the king, preaching against the wickedness of their nation? And look, that is important. That is an important aspect of being a preacher. And, you know, even up to John the Baptist. You know, why was John the Baptist beheaded? It's because he preached against... Herod Antipas, you know, he had, how he had taken his brother's wife for himself, so he had done something unlawful. John the Baptist preaches against him. But John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Okay? Now, after John the Baptist, and after Christ has brought in the new covenant with his death, with the shedding of his blood, I want to ask you this question. Which prophet or which preacher in the New Testament spent their time trying to reform the government or preaching against their politicians? It's not there, right? It's not there. Now, I'm not saying it's ever wrong to do that, and I don't want you to misunderstand that, okay? We have great examples of Old Testament prophets, again, preaching against people in authority, and there's a place for that, but that wasn't the primary thing the preachers of the New Testament were doing, right? The preachers of the New Testament, their primary focus was to reach the lost, was to preach the gospel, was to, uh, you know, teach believers the word of God. That was a primary purpose. And you say, well, what's the reason? Why is that? The reason for this, and I'll get you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Because <clears throat> under the Old Testament, God established a covenant with a physical nation, okay? With a physical nation. And that nation was made up of priests and governors. And eventually they brought in, you know, they, they desired a king. So he falls under that area of authority. And so within the covenant of God's people, God desired that Israel would live godly, that they would live righteously, all right? That they would be blessed on the earth. And when the authorities failed, even when priests failed, you know, God would often raise a man from somewhere that would bring righteousness back into the nation, that would preach against the wickedness. And many times those prophets lost their lives or were persecuted for the message they brought. Okay? So they were preaching to a physical nation. And within the context of preaching to that physical nation, they obviously had to preach against the sins of those people in authority. Okay? Now, when it comes to the New Testament, you, you're turning to 1 Peter chapter 2. Actually, before you, we read that, let me just read to you the Old Testament passage I wanted to read. Exodus 19 verse 5 reads, These are the words of God to the, to the physical nation of Israel. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So God says about the Old Testament Israelites, you are going to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a peculiar treasure, something different, something that stands out. 
And so when God's nation would do wickedly, yes, God will have to bring judgment upon them, would raise prophets to preach against them. And so we see that practice time and time again in the Old Testament. Now you're in 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 9. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, I want you to compare this with what we see in the New Testament. And here, God is not speaking to a physical nation, He's speaking to believers. And He says in verse number 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, notice the next words, and holy nation. The exact same words that God said to the physical nation of Israel in the Old Testament. And notice the next words, a peculiar people. What did he say about the Old Testament nation? They're a peculiar treasure. What does it say about you and I? We're a peculiar people. Hey, we, all the believers of Jesus Christ, make up a holy nation. In Galatians, it's called the Israel of God. It's a spiritual nation. It's a spiritual kingdom. Notice the next words, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, in which time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Okay? So when we preach, the, the purpose of the preacher, the prophet, the pastor, whoever it is that's standing behind the pulpit, my purpose is to preach to the holy nation. That is the spiritual kingdom. Okay? That is the local church that God has given me authority in okay my my primary goal is not to change the hearts of the politicians my, my my aim in life is not to get into politics and think i can change the world for god through politics no my goal is to preach to the people of god to the holy nation that makes up new life baptist church and blessed hope baptist church down in sydney that's where my authority lies now you're you're in first peter go to chapter four look at this first peter chapter four verse 17 and you know i asked you the question where do you see new testament preachers going and preaching against all types of authority you know and they were they had very wicked authority that they were under i tell you why because they belonged to the holy nation the spiritual nation and the king of kings and the lord of lords is always perfect jesus christ will never fail us we will never get to a point where we have to preach against Christ. And you know what? The new man that's in us, that God has given us, the new creature, is perfect without sin. I'm not talking about the flesh. The flesh is corrupt and it's going to continue to sin. I'm talking about the new man is without sin. It's perfect. And it's that same new man that God has made into priests and kings. And so when we talk about the kingly, the authorities, the, prince, uh, the, the, the uh, priests that make up the New Testament, it is all a perfect picture. Or, sorry, not picture. It's, it's all a, a perfect man in Jesus Christ. Okay? So our goal is to preach to the people of God so they can learn and, and gain understanding. That's the primary purpose of the New Testament church you're in first peter look at chapter 4 verse 17 first peter chapter 4 verse 17 the bible says for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of god and if it first begin at us what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of god look there are those that obey the gospel of god what's how do you obey you believe the gospel you're, you're a believer then you should join a church. You should get baptized, join a local Baptist church. And then there are those that do not obey the gospel. They're the unsaved, right? But it's very clear here where judgment begins. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And so my priority is the house of God to preach to the people of God, to help you change from your sinful ways, from your worldly ways, to be aligned with the Bible, to understand the Scriptures and be aligned with our Lord God and not, you know, to, to change what you need to change. We all are weak. We all have struggles. We all have sin. We're at different levels in our spiritual walk and my goal is to help you change. 
My goal is to help you adapt to the standard, the standard being Jesus Christ and His Word. Okay, Judgment must begin at the house of God. This is my primary place for influence. Of course, besides my family, it's the local New Testament church. And if others get influenced, you know, through the ministry of the local church, praise God, that's the cherry on top. But that's not what I'm focused on. I'm focused on the people of God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13 verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. Speaking to believers. Okay? The office of the bishop, the pastor, his job is to watch for the souls of the believers. It's not my job to watch for the souls of our politicians, of our governors, of the unsaved. No, my goal is to watch for the souls of the believers. And the reason I, I'm, I'm going through this, and this is still my introduction. I think, I think the, the meat of my sermon is going to be a lot shorter than my introduction. But I just wanted to obviously cover this because you can spend your life you know, irritated by the government. You can spend your life protesting against, you know, them removing your rights, removing your freedoms. There's nothing wrong with that in of itself. But I just personally think that's going to be a waste of time. That's going to be a a waste of my personal time when I can be using my time for other things. And, uh, you know, the Bible says in in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, you're in 1 Peter, aren't you? So go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and go to verse 11. And this is after what we just read, where how we read that God calls us a peculiar people, a holy nation. That was verse number 9. In number 10, he says that in the past we were not a people, but now are a people of God. In verse number 11, it says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they, might, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. What's that saying, brethren? Is that we are, verse number 11, strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Okay? We're strangers. We're pilgrims. We're passing through. This is not our home. Yes, I'm an Australian citizen. Actually, I'm also a Chilean citizen as well. Okay, I got that a few years ago. But, you know, I will use that, I will use those rights that are given to me. I will use that freedom that's been given to me by these nations when it serves my purpose. When I can, when I, when I, when I kind of need to, just to, to interact in the nation that I'm in. But at the same time, these are not my nations. Okay, I'm a stranger. I'm a pilgrim. I'm just passing through. You're just passing through. Yes, we live in Australia, but this is not our home. Our home is heaven above. And we need to keep that in mind. And that's why I'm, I'm expecting our nation to get worse and worse. I don't want it to get worse and worse. I'm not saying it's okay for our nation to get worse and worse. But when it gets worse, when it becomes more ungodly, I'm not going to panic about it. I'm just going to say, well, God, this is not my world. Thank God it's not my world. You know, home is above, and I'm going to do the best I can to serve you in the capacity that I have to serve you, Lord. And as things change, help me to adapt to the change that we have, Lord, so I don't have to live a frustrated life. That I don't have to live a life that's depressed and worried about the future. No, help me to adapt so I can remain serving you. And again, that's the purpose for my sermon tonight. And uh, actually, if we keep going, look at verse number 13, same chapter. It says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. And so you can see how it ties in. Hey, you're strangers and pilgrims. This is not your world. Australia is not really your nation because you're part of the holy nation of God. But still, because you have to live in this world, you have to submit to the governors, to the kings, to the authorities that God has put into place. And so we have to sort of juggle these two ideas in our minds, right? We are not from here, but at the same time, we should be subject to the authorities that are here 
you know, adapt to the change that's happening while at the same time we still need to continue serving the Lord. You know, I was thinking about King David and how King David, you know, had the power, had a united nation. He lived very much in a time of peace as a king. He had great victories. He had great power. You would think out of all places, out of all people, he would be one that could say, hey, this is my home. This is my nation that I've been given rule over. But in one of his Psalms, in Psalm 39, verse 12, it says, these are the words of David, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace from my tears, for I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner as all my fathers were. King David, who had the entire nation, you know, under his authority, even he says to the Lord God, look, I'm a stranger, I'm a sojourner, I'm just passing through. Okay, and he says, as all my fathers were. You know, he's talking about the spiritual forefathers that he had. He's talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, right? He's talking about Samuel, and, you know, Gideon, and he's, you know, speaking of all these great men, all the great people that have gone before him. He says, I'm just like them, Lord. I'm just a stranger. This is not my world. And he was the king. You know, he was, if anyone was going to be part of this world, you'd think it'd be King David. He says, no, I'm still a pilgrim passing through. And you're in 1 Peter. Go to chapter 1 now. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. And so while we're living in this changing world, we need to understand that, you know, we can't allow this world to corrupt us. We can't, you know, fall into sin just because our world is becoming more sinful. What did Jesus want? He wanted us to be protected from evil, right? Look at verse number 15, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. But as he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Okay, so we're commanded to be holy, to be separate, to be different from the world, just as God is holy or different from this world. But then notice the next last words in verse 17. Pass the time of your sojourning here. Okay, once again, you're just passing through. You're just a pilgrim. Okay, but it says pass your time here in fear. We ought to have a fear of God. Whatever we decide, however we adapt to the changing world around us, we need to not forget the fear of God. That's going to help us, drive us to make the right decisions for ourselves, for our families, for our church, for our workplace, whatever place you have to operate in within this world. And so, you know, adapting to change. And I've got, uh, I think, I've, is it five points that I've got here? Let me just double check. Yeah, I've got five points for you tonight uh, for you to think about when it comes to adapting to change. All right, stay in 1 Peter and look at chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. The first point that I have for you, brethren, we are living in a changing world. And as I said to you, I've found myself getting frustrated. I'm sure you have. But if we want to adapt, then we need to welcome the challenge. We need to welcome the challenge and say, this is a challenging time. This is a time where I have to make certain decisions. Am I going to comply? Am I not going to comply? What do I do, Lord? And you can get worried, right? But no, embrace the challenge. Welcome the challenge. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 reads, Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Look, when we talk about a challenge, we talk about something that is going to try you. It's going to try your faith. It's going to try your patience. 
It's going to try your wisdom. You are going through a period of trial right now with all these changes. So am I. So is the entire world. So are believers across this world going through trying times. But how are we to handle these trying times? How are we to do that? Look at verse number 13. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy, that ye may be glad with exceeding joy. A trying of your faith. Wow. You know, this is something that is, is so challenging for me as a believer because I know I hate change. I know I hate having to adapt when I've gotten comfortable in doing things a certain way. And then you have no choice but to make some changes. The Lord wants us to be glad, right? The Lord wants us to rejoice when we go through these challenges. And so we need to accept the challenge. You know, see how God will mature you, how God will change you, how, you know, the things you once did, you may have to re-examine and say, well, I need to do things a different way. Hey, you're going to have to face your fears sometimes. And that's not always a bad thing. You know, the only way you can overcome your fears is by facing those fears. We don't like to be challenged, okay? But these are challenging times. What do we do as believers? How do we operate churches under these new restrictions? How do we go soul winning? You know, all these things that we speak about with different brethren, we all have different ideas, we all have different thoughts around this, but it ought to challenge us in how can, you know, asking yourself the question, how can I further serve the Lord? You know, and for our church, you know, I, you know, for those that know, that some people have asked me, you know, will you ever do live streaming? Are you ever going to live stream your church services? And since we started the church, you know, some two and a half years ago, I've always said no. You know, that's off the table. I'm never going to live stream a service, okay? But that was before the COVID-19 restrictions. That was before the new normal, okay? And so when we've been challenged with something new, the question is, do we stay? Do I just keep doing the old? Do I just continue doing things the same way? Or do we re-examine and say, well, this is a new challenge. How can we adapt to this challenge? And one of the great blessings that I've seen come about is we've been able to reach out, you know, just organically to other believers across Australia that listen to our preaching, that have participated in our prayer time, and now I'm not just thinking about my local church. I'm thinking about saints that are scattered throughout Australia that may not have a good church to go to or may want to supplement the preaching that they hear from their church with preaching here. And that's fine. But now I realize we need to help, you know, offer these people an opportunity to be part of the, the live services, you know. And uh, this is something that I've been examining. You know, we need to, we don't have the technology in place. We don't have the internet connection in place right now. But the question is then, do we start thinking about these things? Do we embrace the change? Do we adapt to this new situation? Because I believe now we can be a greater blessing, not just to our church, but to brethren that are throughout this world. You know, if it, if it were not for this COVID-19 restrictions, I would still be saying no to live streaming. Okay, I'd still be saying that's not something I want to do. But you know what? We need to adapt to change. And we need to, you know see where we are and rethink the, the current situation you are in. And that's where things get uncomfortable sometimes. Point number one is embrace the challenge. Point number two is to choose to be positive. Choose to be positive. You know, there are some people that are a glass half full and some people are glass half empty. You know, those that look at a glass with water and if, the, if, if you know, it's only... There's only half that glass is filled with water. Some will say, well, it's half full. And that's a positive mentality. They're thinking about what the glass contains. But the ones that say it's half empty, they're focused on what it doesn't contain. Okay? And they're the ones that are more uh, negative-minded. But we need to choose to be positive. If you want to adapt to change, you need to have your mind set on positive things. 
Philippians 4 verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know what that means? Think positively. You know, think of good things. When you're going through a change, Think about what's the benefit? What can I get out of this? What, how can I be positive about this situation? You know, not to think about all the things that you, you wish you had, you know, in this new environment. How can I continue, you know, serving the Lord? How can I continue being a godly father? How can I continue growing in knowledge and experience so God can use me in a mighty way? We need to choose to be positive. Colossians 3 1 says, If ye then be reasoning with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Set your affection on the things above. Think positive. This world's getting worse. You know, this world's becoming more ungodly. We're going to get closer and closer to a one world government, closer to a one world religion, closer to the mark of the beast, closer to the persecution of God's people. But if you're only focused on this earth, if you're only focused on the temple, you are going to be negative. You are going to be downcast and depressed. And so the command is, well, don't think about the things here. Think about above. Think about heaven. Think about the future. Think about eternal matters. That's going to help you stay positive. You know what I desire most of my children? Oh, that they get a great education, that they get a high paying job. No, what I want for my children is that they get saved. What I want for my children is that they would have their hearts set on eternal things, that they would be rewarded by God, that they would be greatly appreciated uh, in heaven for, for the works they did for the Lord. That's where the true riches are. That's where you can stay positive-minded if, if you have your hearts and minds set on heavenly places, not on this earth. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.16 Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And then it says this in verse 18. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What is God's will for me during this lockdown, during these restrictions? What is God's will for me? Well, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God. In everything, no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad you think it might get, God still wants you to give thanks in everything. Whatever situation you find yourself in, this is how you adapt to change. You think positive. You give God the thanks that you can go through such a time so you can be tested and tried, you know, that you can be challenged. What an opportunity we have to to see how we can expand our influence in this world during these difficult times. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, I love this verse. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22 says, A merry heart, merry means a joyful, happy heart. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. And look, sometimes we do need medicine. Sometimes you are downcast frustrated, depressed. But the Bible says the medicine for that is a merry heart, a happy heart, a joyful heart. Think positively, okay? Choose to be positive. That's how you're going to uh, be able to adapt to change. The third point that I have is re-examine your boundaries. Re-examine your boundaries. This might sound weird, okay? But I think it's important. And uh, I'll get you to turn to uh, Mark chapter 7. Please go to Mark chapter 7. And I'll read some other passages to you. But you go to Mark chapter 7. I'm talking about re-examining your boundaries, okay? You see, all of us have some code of ethics 
that we live by. Okay? Now, primarily, hopefully, it's built on the Word of God. You know, that's, that's number one. And God has set certain boundaries in our life. You know, when God created Adam, you know, he told him that he could eat of every tree, tree except for one. You know, Adam had a lot of freedom. But there was one tree. There was, there was a boundary. There was something put in place uh, where if he, you know, uh, overstepped the ba- that boundary, he would commit God, uh, sin unto God. And so God has put boundaries in our life. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says... Whosoever committeth sin, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Okay, so God has given us His laws, He's given us His commandments in the Word of God, written in our hearts as well. And if you were to break those boundaries, the laws that God has, then that's when we commit sin. You see, God wants us to live with a lot of freedom, with a lot of liberty, okay? in your Christian life. You are free as a Christian, but he's got boundaries, and those boundaries are you breaking the law of God. You break the law of God, you cross those boundaries, you commit sin, okay? So as long as you operate within the boundaries of God, you will not sin, okay? So, but we should have boundaries, okay? So we do have boundaries. I'm not talking about re-examine the boundaries that God has laid out when it comes to sin. I'm not talking about that, okay? But there is a secondary boundary that we all have. It's not just the Word of God. We also have other things that we have in place. Just a very quick example of this. We know the Bible commands that we have to discipline our children to use the rod. Okay, That's very clear. If you don't discipline, you don't use a rod, you're in sin. But God doesn't tell you how to apply. You know How how many smacks do you give a child when they're disobedient? What about when they're lying? What if they stole something? What if they had a bad attitude? You know, my wife and I, we have different ways of handling that. You know, I've, I've taught on this before, but if our child lies to us, they get five smacks just for lying. Okay, plus whatever else they did, um, you know, they would get something else for that. But, you know, we have within the boundaries that God has given us, we also have our own boundaries or our own set of rules or our own code of ethics, if you want, that we, we live by as long as it's within the boundaries of God's Word. All right, we set some, some rules. So I, I'll, I just term this the secondary boundaries. And I'll just read to you from Romans 14, verse 23. This is speaking about whether it's right or wrong to eat certain foods. I won't get into all that topic right now. But in Romans 14, verse 23, it says, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. All right, so if someone, if there's two Christians, and I think it's right for me as a Christian to eat this, but another Christian says, no, it's not right for me to eat the same thing. Well, if he does eat of it, even though he, you know, he, he thinks it's wrong, and he still eats of it, that is sin, because he's not eating in faith. He's eating with doubt. Okay, so this is where it comes to a matter of opinions. We may have different opinions. We may have different thoughts, as long as they are within the boundaries of God's word. But if someone thinks, no, this is wrong for me to do, and they do it, then they've committed sin. But notice this is someone's personal opinion versus the personal opinion of another Christian. Okay? And this is why you know, I never expect anybody to live their lives exactly like me. Because we all have these secondary boundaries that we have in place that we want to stay within because if we do break them, we are committing sin because we may have certain doubts. And the reason I say that, say that is uh, because sometimes those secondary boundaries, when, when, when it comes to change, we, we are forced to re-examine those secondary boundaries. Okay? We, we are forced to examine, kind of like what I just said about live streaming. You know, I've had to re-examine now, I think it's a good idea. You know, to, to try live streaming, though before that, I didn't think it was a good idea. But whether I do it or not is not a sin, right? It's just that I've had to re-examine that. So we've got to re-examine our boundaries. You're in Mark chapter 7, verse 6. Mark chapter 7 and verse number 6. This is so important because as you grow, as you mature, you're going to gain more knowledge. You're going to, you know, maybe have, you know, you, you may do things a certain way today, but five years from now, you may do something, the same thing differently. Or you may view that thing differently than you thought before. Maybe the way you do it today 
Back when you were, you know, back five years ago, maybe you would have said, hey, that's a stupid way of doing it. That's sinful. But then five years down the track, as you've matured in the Lord, as you've grown in, in, in your Bible knowledge, you realize, hold on, that was just my personal opinion. Actually, there's nothing that is actually sinful with the way I'm doing it today. But if I was five years ago, I would have looked at that and thought that was sinful. Okay? So we have to re-examine our personal boundaries. Mark chapter 7, verse 6. And Jesus Christ is speaking to some religious leaders. He answered and said unto them, Well have Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. So what is this about? This is when Jesus Christ and the disciples were hungry. They ate some, some grain, but they didn't wash their hands before eating. Now, should you wash your hands? I think you should. All right. These, these uh, Pharisees thought that Jesus and the disciples should wash their hands. Okay? So they had, a, they had certain rules that they had placed you know, God was very careful about teaching, you know, about being clean and unclean. And the Pharisees took it one step further and said, well, hold on, we need to create some laws here. And nothing wrong with that, okay? Like I said, God gives us certain instructions, and then even me as a father, my wife, we, we need to come together sometimes and say, well, how are we going to manage our, our family, our lives, in light of the boundaries that God has? And we may establish certain traditions, certain ways of doing things in our families. You may demand your children to go wash their hands before they come to sit on the dinner table, right? And so there's nothing wrong with that in of itself, right? But what had happened is the Pharisees were so stuck in their ways, right, that they had created new laws and they were saying, hey, if you don't follow the laws we've put in place, if you don't follow the traditions we've put in place, then you're committing sin. Okay, they've had gone so far in making their traditions like the commandments of God. Instead of it being a help to appreciate the commandments of God, they had basically diminished the commandments of God and were elevating their traditions as though they were the commandments of God. And so these Pharisees couldn't adapt to change. Hey, I'm sure if Jesus and his disciples had a dinner table, had somewhere they could wash their hands, I'm sure they would have gone and just washed their hands before they ate. But they were in a situation where they were very hungry. They had no choice but to eat some, some grain that they were, of, of, you know, of uh, wheat they were uh, walking by. And they ate of it. Hey, they were ready to adapt to change as long as the change was within the boundaries of God's word. Okay? So sometimes we need to re-examine our boundaries. And there's nothing wrong with having your secondary boundaries as long as they are not contradictive to the word of God. But you'll find as you grow, as you mature, as you learn the Bible more, there are going to be things that you think today are so important for me to keep. And then you'll find out a few years later, I was probably a little bit too strict on that. Okay? As long as, once again, you are within the boundaries of God, that you are not sinning against Him. Okay? If you need to be able to re-examine, okay? change your thoughts, your ideas, to be more in alignment with the Word of God. The next point that I have is to admit your mistakes. If you want to be someone that is able to adapt to change, you're going to have to say from time to time, I made a mistake. You know, I was, you know, I was, I was stubborn. I didn't want to change on this. But now I realize I was mistaken. You know, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. We need to admit when we do wrong. And especially if you're someone in leadership, if you're a pastor, you need to admit to your church when you've done wrong. If you're a father, if you've done something wrong to your family, you need to admit when you've done wrong. If you're an employer, you know, and, and you mess up on the job, you need to admit when you've done wrong. One thing I, I've learned and discovered, this might seem contrary to your thinking, but when a person of leadership does a mistake and they just own up to the mistake and say, guys, I'm sorry, it's on me, you know, it rallies the people under them. And, and usually they're more loyal. 
you know, they've got a greater appreciation for the leader because they realize, hey, this guy is not prideful. He has humility. He is looking out for our best interest. Yes, he made a mistake, but he's willing to change, tune, and, and go a different way. And in order for you to be able to adapt to change is for you to admit when you've done wrong. I'm not saying you've, you know, we, we all do wrong at different points in life, right? You know, even the Bible says in James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You see, even your faults, these are not your sins. We're not to go to our, confess our sins and, and get our brethren to forgive us for our sins the way God forgives our sins. No, no, no. Listen, when we have faults, you know, when we have weaknesses, we should pray. When you're sick, you know, ask your brethren to pray for you. If you're struggling in an area, ask your brethren to pray for you. If you're struggling to adapt to the restrictions that we have in Australia, ask your brethren to pray for you. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, if you just have people praying for you, it's going to help you. It's going to help change you, to help you overcome your mistakes and the faults that you do have. And brethren, once you have admitted your mistakes, you move on. You don't live in the past. You know, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul says, man, I made a lot of mistakes in my life. I messed up. You know, I thought I was something, but I realized I was nothing. He says, I'm just going to forget all that, and I'm going to move on with my life. I'm going to admit the mistakes, and now I'm going to move on and serve the Lord. You know, you cannot adapt to change if you're holding on to your mistakes. If you're too prideful to admit that you've been wrong, hey, let go of it. Just confess it, put it behind you, and move forward recognize the new challenge that God has allowed you to go through and see how can I be effective for the Lord in this situation. And the last point that I have for you, let me just read the, the first four points. Number one was welcome the challenge. Number two was choose to be positive. Number three, uh, re-examine your boundaries. And number four, admit your mistakes. The last point that I have for you in, to help you adapt to change is look at the big picture. Look at the big picture. Don't be focused on just the coronavirus or you know, just the changes that are happening in our law. You know, don't be focused on this. You know, I'll just read that passage to you. Hebrews 11 verse 9. Hebrews 11. You can actually turn there. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 9. I realize when you're focused on the bigger picture, you're going to understand why the changes are necessary and how I can adapt to those changes. You know, I just, the times that in, in my workplace, I, I, I personally, I liked to bring about change when I felt this was going to be a positive impact in my work environment, okay? But I realized when I would talk about the change, people, other people didn't like it sometimes, okay? And the reason for that is because I've looked at the big picture and I looked at and I realized if I make these changes here and there, it's going to help the big picture. We're going to be more effective as business. We're going to reduce the amount of effort it takes to do one job and we can spend our more, more of our time doing some other jobs. Okay? I was focused on the big picture. And then what I discovered when other people wanted to make changes, I didn't like their ideas. And again, the reason was because I didn't know the big picture. They would tell me what the changes were, but I didn't understand how those changes tie in to the bigger picture. But they spent the time, obviously, looking at the big picture and how these changes you know, affect that. So I realized once you understand the big picture, you'd be more on board with the changes. Okay? What is the big picture for the Christian? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9. And we're sort of coming full circle now as the way we started this sermon. But it says here, by faith, and it's speaking about the Old Testament saints, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise 
as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which have foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So this is about Abraham, right? So what was, he, what was his big picture? Was his big picture how he can become rich and powerful on this earth? Was he focused on the a physical land? Was he focused on the temporal things? No, he was focused on a city whose builder and maker is God. Okay, look at verse number 13, same chapter. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So brethren, what do we need to do? We need to confess that we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth, just like the Old Testament saints did. Hey, do we expect Australia to become this Christ-fearing nation? You know, where, where all, you know, all Australians be, get saved? Now look, I, I want that. I, I hope for that, right? My desire is to play a part in that, but that's not the big picture because I know it's not going to happen. I know what the Bible teaches. I know that the world's going to wax worse and worse. And the only hope that I have for a righteous government, the only hope that I truly have where I can have all my freedoms and all my rights is in that heavenly city. Okay? That's it. That's home. That's where I belong. I'm a stranger. I'm a pilgrim on this earth. Verse number 14. And they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he have prepared for them a city. Please go to Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22 for me. And so you can see the hearts of the saints here, right? They desired the heavenly. They desired to be with the Lord. That was the big picture. And for the 70, 80, 100 years of life or more that they lived on this earth, they just saw themselves as pilgrims. Okay? Now look, that's what a, a pilgrim has to be someone that's adaptable to change. Because they're not going to be living in one place necessarily all their life. They're going to be moving from place to place to place to place just to do what the Lord wants from them. They're going where the Lord wants them to go, doing what the Lord wants them to do, and they're just going to have to adapt with whatever neighbors or whatever situation they found themselves in. Jesus Christ, when he walked this earth, Jesus Christ, the Lord God, was not looking to reform the Roman Empire. He was not looking to chase them away or to, to have war against them and to bring back you know, the old ways. No, Christ had his heart set on eternity. He had his mind set on the big picture. And he instructed his disciples to have their hearts set on the big picture. And that's going to help you adapt to change. Because this world's going to keep changing, brethren. It is going to get worse. And you just have to accept it. You're just going to have to accept it and say, Lord, I live in 2020, right? You've placed me at this point in time where there are going to be some challenges to our Christian liberties. Lord, how do you want me to live my life in accordance to your commands? How is it that I can see this out? All right? Look at the big picture. You're in Revelation. Look at 22, Revelation 22, verse 3. Revelation 22, verse 3. Speaking of the new heavens and the new earth. That's the big picture, brethren. It says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Hey, we're going to finally see the face of the Father. Verse number 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, 
and they shall reign forever and ever. We're going to reign in a new earth forever and ever. In the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, that's my government. You know, the Bible calls us ambassadors of Christ. You know, we are representatives of heaven. We are representatives of the new heaven and the new earth, not of this old earth. Okay, brethren, I want you to keep in mind these five things as you struggle through change. And look, it's not just the coronavirus. You know, maybe you're physically changing. Maybe you have sicknesses you didn't have before. Maybe you have opinions now that have changed. Maybe your, your interests, your hobbies have changed. Okay? Maybe your desires have changed. Or maybe you're holding on to old things and you need, to, you need to realize, I need to let go of this. I need to change my perspective in order for God to use me at my, at, you know, my fullest ability. Well, you need to be someone that is adaptable to change. And again, we don't like change. Generally speaking, we don't like change. But thank God, He never changes. Thank God we can always have Him at our right hand. We can always serve Him. And we know whatever we do for the Lord will remain constant, will remain true with the big picture in place. Let me summarize those five points once again. Number one, this is the conclusion. Welcome the challenge. Appreciate that you get to go through a challenging time. Number two, choose to be positive. Number three, uh, re-examine your boundaries. Number four, admit your mistakes. Hey, move on from your mistakes. And number five, look at the big picture. God bless.